darker with the darker or brighter or fuzzy, the the um, the electron in this in this image is more likely to be found near the nucleus and less likely to be found where this cloud fades away. Um, so the cloud is really representing the probability distribution of where you might find an electron if you went and measured its position. And that gives us all that, that idea and those calculations that go into um, figuring that out give us the wave functions that we're familiar, um, sorry, the orbitals that we're familiar with from chemistry. Um, so in this image, which is on um, Wikimedia, it's a plot of all the hydrogen wave functions. And these repeat in the other elements, which is why some of these shapes might be familiar to, to you if you've done some chemistry. Um, so these with uh, these are labeled by the quantum numbers NLM. Um, the first quantum number represents the energy level and the other two are related to the angular momentum of the, um, of the electron in the orbitals. And uh, these um, are symmetric and then some of them are, are less symmetric. Um, so this is, this is a P orbital um, and then they get to be really complex shapes. So what these orbitals are really representing is, is where you're likely to find the electron. And if the electron's in this p orbital, you're very unlikely to find it over here. Um, but you are very likely to find it in this low. Um, so this is a just reorienting our minds to how we think about um, atoms and how we think about where electrons are and what determines where they are. Now, just for a sense of scale, and, and maybe you all know this, but it's something that's easily forgotten. Um, so here's an atom, and here's the approximate scale in meters of how big an atom is. Now, if we scaled everything up, so say an atom, let's make an atom about the size of, of a pizza, piece of pizza, okay? So now we take this atom and we scale it up to something tangible, like 10 centimeters. Now we scale the pizza up in a proportion to how much we scaled the atom. Okay, the pizza would end up being bigger than the sun. So this is this is how tiny this world is that that we study um, and try to probe. Um, so it's really really hard to see an atom. Um, and here's an, a useful chart for how you see things that are small. Um, so here's a scale in um, in meters of things you can see with your eye and examples of what they are. Okay, so you can see the thickness of a human hair with your eye. Um, but if you wanna go smaller than that, you've gotta use a microscope. And a microscope uses optics to magnify light, okay? Um, and then when the objects get to be about the same scale as the wavelength of the light, you need to use a different kind of microscope. Um, so an electron microscope allows you to see things that are, that are much, much smaller than waves of light can see. And they're using wave-like properties, the ones that are, meant, that are, that are described here, um, are using wave-like properties of the electron instead of the wave-like properties of light, which is an interesting concept on its own. Um, and those microscopes can get down to the scale of atoms, but that's not the type of microscope I'm gonna tell you about today. I'm gonna tell you about a quantum mechanical tunneling microscope. So here's our starting point. We take a sharp wire and we're gonna represent the very end of the sharp wire. Um, this could be a piece of platinum, for example, a wire of platinum or gold. Um, and we're gonna represent the atoms at the very end of the wire as a collection of orbitals. And I've chosen a symmetric S orbital just to keep it simple. So now instead of seeing this as, a, as an atom, imagine it as an orbital so that you're seeing the probability distribution of where the electron in the atom could be, okay? And then we take an atomic surface that we wanna study um, and we put the tip of wire very close to the surface, but not touching it. And the atomic surface is also made up of atoms um, that I'm representing here um, as, as orbitals showing probability distribution of where the electron could be. Okay, <clears throat> so that's our starting point. Now, if we treat the electron like a particle, then we can throw, so we have an electron that's 
in this atom at the end of this metal wire, okay? And we apply some, some voltage to entice the, elect the electron to, to exit the atom and go into this material. Well, you can do that. You can, you can do that um, by basically exciting the electron over the top of the barrier between them. This gap is like a no-go zone. So you have to give the electron a lot of energy if you want to get it to go into this empty space and then go into the material. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, what, we're, what we're going to show is that the electron um, can get into the material without actually ever existing in this vacuum zone, okay? Um, so if we, if we thought about the electron as like a classical ball though, then this is a gap that the electron with this amount of energy, the electron can't, um, can't get across this gap. This, is a, this looks like a barrier to the electron. It's stuck in the atom. And so it will bounce off this wall, right? So classically, we can't explain how this works, but in quantum mechanics, the electron is actually described, um, it has a, a wave-like form. Um, it can be treated as a wave, and this is the symbol that's typically used, psi, to describe the electron's wave function. Um, and the wave function itself can exist inside the barrier. So here's the, here's the wave of the electron in the atom, and then here's how the, the electron wave function decays inside the barrier. Okay, so this is, this is mathematically how it works. Um, and so it will decay, and if the barrier is very wide, um, there's really no probability of finding the electron on the other side. It's very, very small. Um, but it turns out that if you make this barrier, um, the width of the barrier small enough, you can have this wave function decay, but still, but still exist on the other side of the barrier. So this wave function of the electron still exists over here. Okay, so this is the um, this is what's behind quantum tunneling, is that the electron, if you treat it like a wave and and you um, look at the math carefully, you can get the electron from one side of the barrier, from inside the atom of the of this metal tip, into the sample. And the probability of that occurring is related to the amplitude of that wave function psi. So we call that psi squared. So the probability is proportional to psi squared. That's the probability of finding the electron somewhere in space, okay? And here I've plotted psi squared for the wave function um, in the sample down here um, as a function of the tunneling gap the distance between the tip and the sample, okay? So as you move the wire closer to the sample, you decrease that tunneling gap and the probability that you're going to find the electron in the sample goes up and it goes up exponentially. This means that you're extremely sensitive to changes in height right at this junction. Um, so that is the entire principle of, of the um, tunneling microscope. Now, mechanically how it works is also kind of a miracle. So I told you this is, this is a tip of wire, and I've also told you that you can get this tip of wire within um, less than a nanometer of the surface of an atomic material. Um, but then we, if we look, think back to the, the pizza argument, these distances are extremely small. So how do we even control something mechanically to make that gap real? Um, so this is, this is a schematic of what the um, STM, a scanning tunneling microscope looks like. So in real life, you have your wire here. Here, this is a tungsten wire. It's very sharp. Um, and then you have your sample, which is represented in blue. And the wire is attached to um, piezoelectric materials. And the, this is the device that makes all this possible because a piezoelectric material, if you apply a voltage to it, changes its shape just slightly. And you can control that change in shape less than an angstrom. So 
um, a tenth of a nanometer. So that is the change. That's that's that level of control is what enables the rest of the experiments to happen. They're based on the quantum mechanical tunneling effect, um, but the uh, they would never work without piezoelectric materials. So so you control the distance between the tip and the sample with this this um, high voltage on this, these piezos, and then you can also use the same principle to control the motion of the tip across the surface, which we haven't talked about yet, but that's how you get an image. You don't only wanna just tunnel in one place, you wanna tunnel in that place and compare it to the next place. So here's how that works. <clears throat> so on the atomic scale, this is this, similar to the diagram I showed you on the previous slide. Um, you have the tip of atoms and you have the sample atoms and this gap here is on the, on the order of one nanometer in order for there to be some reasonable probability that an electron will tunnel from one material into the other. Um, and in order to get that tunneling to occur, you apply um, to occur preferentially in one direction, you apply a, a voltage between the tip and the sample. Um, and that's, um, and that bias is what is one of the controls that you have in the experiment, choosing that. Um, and then you get some tunneling current, which is represented here by this black curve. So now if you imagine you get this tunneling current, it's some value here, but if you move the tip over a little bit so that the tip, tip of the atom is like between the atoms on the sample surface, your tunnel current is gonna go down because now you've increased, you've, you've increased the gap um, between the tip and the sample. So in that way, the tip is very, very sensitive to changes in height on the surface. Um, so you can see this trace here. It is following the blue atoms. And then here, you can see that it actually goes up again because there's an extra layer of atoms here. So you're, this is the measurement of an atomic step. So you scan this tip across the surface, collecting these traces. Um, and I like this illustration because it's showing like, okay, what if you have a different atom here? Like this atom is gold in color. In their, in their um, cartoon, they show that the, the current that you get from that tunneling event is, is a little bit less. Um, so the tunneling exponentially depends on the gap distance, which is what allows you to collect these beautiful images. Um, and here's one example from my group. Um, it's sort of traditional for an STM group to measure this particular um, surface reconstruction on silicon. Um, this is a pattern that only occurs on the surface of silicon 111 if you prepare the surface a certain way. And it was a big mystery in surface science for maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, and it's just beautiful. So it's a great example of what you can see with one of these microscopes. Shona, where are the atoms? Are there atoms here? Yes, thank you, Patrick. Um, in this image, the atoms are purple and the gaps mm -hmm. between the atoms are blue. So all the purple dots are silicon atoms and they've arranged themselves in this crazy tile pattern um, because of the energetics on that surface in that situation. Okay, and this is nice because it also shows you that the um, microscope can tell you what a perfect lattice looks like, and it can also show you where the lattice isn't perfect. And sometimes this is a very local effect, and other types of methods that look at where atoms are in space can be averaging type methods. So it's harder to see the spatial representation of, of these defects. Okay. So now let's let's make an STM. Um, so imagine you have a whole container of gumballs. So you throw these gumballs into a little boat and they naturally arrange themselves in a pattern, which is kind of neat. So this is, this is the pattern that represents your atomic surface. And if you wanna simulate what an STM is doing, you can just take a compass and a pen and sort of trace over the tops of the atoms um, to make a line on a piece of paper. And this is a good way to just visualize what's happening with the STM. The mechanism for the STM um, is to 
hold the tunneling current, current um, at a constant value. So the tip is actually going up and down like the pin in this picture. Um, that's the way that we normally operate the STM. And then you do this over and over again for every line on your surface to construct a two-dimensional image. And now here's the actual lab. Um, this is the inside of the microscope. It's suspended on springs because it's very, um, it's very sensitive to vibrations. Um, and this is a, a former graduate student of mine, Jake, who is staring intently at a problem with the microscope because in experimental physics, we're always fixing problems, whether they're scientific or mechanical or electronic, there's always a problem to fix. Um, so this is one of those examples, um, but it also shows you how beautiful these um, pieces of hardware are. They're very carefully constructed. This microscope is a commercial instrument from RHK Technologies, um, and it lives inside of this big vacuum chamber. And the vacuum chamber keeps the surfaces clean and allows us to do much better experiments. Um, so the vacuum chamber is kept at 10 to the minus 10 um, tor, uh, which is like 10 to the minus 13 atmospheres. So it's, it's a very, very good vacuum, better than space. So I like to say that this is a, that we have reverse space in our lab because in order to get anything inside or outside the microscope, we have to use this load lock. So we close this valve here. We let um, nitrogen gas into this part of the chamber so that we can open this door and put our samples in. And then we close the door and pump this load lock out so that it's at very low, um, low pressure. Um, and then we can open this, this gate valve and move the samples into where we study them. Uh, so it's the reverse of what astronauts would do on a space station um, where they have to go into a chamber to um, depressurize before they enter space. And here's what's inside this big window. This is the same instrument that's over on the left. Um, and this is where this tip of wire is kept. And this little tiny metal handle here is holding the sample. <clears throat> and this is what it looks like through um, the telescope that looks into the chamber. We can see that we have this very sharp metal tip. And then we see the sample surface. You can see that part of the sample surface is a little bit hard to see, but this shiny part of the metal surface, you can see uh, the mirror image of the tip there. So what we do in practice is we get the mirror image and the tip itself very close together. Um, and then we enable an automatic um, approach mechanism that gets us close enough to have this tunneling current. Okay, and then we go and operate the thing. And this is a, um, a screen recording of an actual experiment that's been happening in the lab this week. Um, so you get to see all of the stuff that we see when we take data. Um, so there's a whole bunch of control parameters on this page. Um, here is where we set the voltage that the experiment's happening at. So this is the bias between the tip and the sample. And here it's negative 300 millivolts. We also control the current. Um, so the current right now is set to negative 100 picoamps. So just for a sense, like amps is what people typically talk about. What well, comes out of the wall, um, is on the order of amps. Um, so this is a very, very small current measurement. And then this is, these are our feedback loop parameters. So we, we adjust these to, this is what controls the, um, the height of the tip on the surface. Um, and we have to adjust these to make the experiment work really well. Um, so the tip is actually moving up and down, um, recording this data. And what you're seeing on the oscilloscope over here is that is that topography, it's the Z changing. Um, so this is, this is showing you this up and down motion is the tip moving up and down as it scans across the sample. Um, and those features that are hard to see in the oscilloscope are being plotted in this 2D map as the tip moves on the sample. So you can see there are these rows here um, that are becoming clearer as, um, as we go down in this image. Um, and you can also see that it's not perfect. Like there's a lot of a lot of variation in the tunnel junction that can cause the images to be kind of 
like re either really, really good images or like not so great images. This one I would say is a pretty average day in the lab. Um, so we can see these rows and these rows are actually atomic rows. Um, so there's like a, the, you can kind of see the zigzag here, but this is a zigzag row of phosphorus atoms. That's what we're imaging here. And um, let's see, some other things you can see in this part of the oscilloscope, you're seeing the current. Um, the current set to, to 100 picoamps. It's negative because the voltage is negative. Um, and you can also see that it's like not perfect. There's a lot of variation around 100. This is part of what we're tuning when we tune the feedback loop is to try and get this to be um, stable and at 100. Um, and then there's this other thing down here, which is called LIA current, okay? This is the feature that allows us to look at that specific cut in energy. And it allows us to detect where, um, how, many, how many states there are for electrons at that specific energy. So this signal is looking for um, what the states, what the density of states looks like for electrons at negative 300 millivolts, which can be considered an energy. And it's using an amplitude of 15 millivolts to do that. So it's like um, negative 300 millivolts plus or minus 15 millivolts is, is really the slice of energy that it's looking at. Um, and you can see that a lot of those features are similar to what you see in the topography in the height data, but there are also features that are not apparent in the height data because you're really just taking a slice of the states at that energy. So there's a blue ring around the defect that's being imaged here, that's coming into view, um, is an electronic only feature. It's not really showing up in the topography in the same way. Um, so there's just so much information you can get out of these types of images. Um, <clears throat> so I hope you've enjoyed this view of what an STM experiment actually looks like. It also gives you an appreciation for how long it takes to get this data. This is not like snapping a picture. Um, this is a pretty average um, scan rate, it's half a second per line. Um, and you can see that, you know, it's, it's not, it's like way more exciting than watching paint dry, um, but it's, it take, it's time consuming, it takes a long time. And part of the reason it's time consuming is that you have to, you have to wait at each, at e each position to get the data, uh, make sure you're taking the data well enough. And so um, this, the, one of my students who created this recording for me also created a time-lapse in case you're really impatient. So here's a time-lapse of setting up the experiment. Um, there we go. So he's choosing where to put the, where to take the data, and then it's sped up a lot. So you can see the whole image coming in really fast. Um, and, and that's really um, that's really what an STM experiment looks like. Now, to give you an idea of like the bigger picture, like that's just image taking one image, right? So what is it like to do a whole experiment in an STM? Um, these are some slides that I created when I was a postdoc. So this um, hardware is a little bit different. And this is a this is an instrument that's at Ohio State University and Jay Gupta's group. Um, and here is a picture looking in the tiny, tiny window that looks at the instrument here. It's also in a vacuum chamber. Um, and this is a picture from inside the chamber of what the instrument looks like. This is the tip here, this sharp wire. Here, I think I have a zoom. This is the sharp wire that's the tip. And in this case, we were looking at um, this, this copper crystal, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, so just for scale, here's a penny compared to this, um, compared to the, to the STM itself. So the actual guts of the instrument are very, very tiny. Now let's use that penny a little bit more um, in a moment. So here's one image. This, is, this was the largest image we could take at one time with the instrument at Ohio State. Um, so, and, and there's a lot to see here. Um, so most of what you're seeing is copper. The little black dots um, are, um, are carbon monoxide atoms or molecules on top of the copper. And these bright lines are atomic steps in the copper. And then there's this smooth defect-free region over here, which I'll tell you about in a second. 
So the ex in the experiment, we take lots and lots and lots of these images over this entire area. And this is the, the sort of map of the world according to the STM tip, because that's all, that's the entire region that the STM tip can access. And you'll notice that the experimenter, who I think was me, um, avoided a lot of regions in this image. Um, so we'll see why in a moment. Um, first, I want to tell you about this scale. Um, this is this whole image is is less is a little bit more than half a micron. Um, and then what we're seeing in the image, in addition to the copper crystal, which is most of the area of the image, are these smooth island regions. Um, and these are graphene islands that we grew on copper. This was part of my postdoc work. Um, so we grew these in a kind of funny way, and we were studying the properties of these islands. And you can see that a large region of this map um, I've avoided because you can see how it gets a really nasty around the edges here. Um, the tip was strongly interacting some, with something. So when they were exploring, um, exploring the oceans in ancient times, and they knew that there was a region of the sea that was very dangerous, they would write in Latin, um, here be dragons. So the, one of the students that I worked with drew this dragon for me. Um, to represent this area where you just don't want to explore. You don't want to take your STM tip into this dangerous region. Because then your experiment may just be over. You've ruined your experiment and you have to start from scratch. Um, and sorry, Mario, your princess is in another castle. So that's sort of what the STM experiment might be like. <clears throat> now, another, another picture for sense of scale. Here's the back of the penny that we saw earlier, and you can see Abraham Lincoln sitting in the Lincoln, um, Lincoln Monument, which is very familiar to all of you, I think, um, and this grain of um, salt, which is about 300 microns on a side. Okay, so let's say we zoom in on, on Abraham Lincoln as he looks on the back of the penny. If you were able to perfectly resolve Abraham Lincoln on the penny, and you were able to see one single hair on his head on the back of the penny, that would be the same scale as that map, that entire map of the world that I showed you. <clears throat> In other words, if we look at the pixelated image of the penny, so we just take a look at the pixels right over by his head, um, you would be able to fit 300 maps of the world in one of those pixels. So that's, that's the scale that we're able to see with the STM. And that's not even the atoms. That's the map of the world. So now how do we get from the map of the world to the atoms? Well, let's zoom in on one of these graphene islands. Here's a bigger image. Zoom in again. Here's a bigger image. That has some pattern in it. Those are not the atoms. That's actually a moray pattern, which is something that I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, then we keep going and these are the atoms. That's where the atoms are in this image. So it's an incredible difference in scale from our everyday lives. Another pretty image, this is graphene on silicon carbide. And back to the STM again, I just wanna emphasize that because we're using electrons to probe the surface, we are sensitive to where the electrons can live in the surface. That meaning we are sensitive to what the states are in, in the material for electrons. And this is a nice example here. This is a um, image from the same data set I just showed you. In one of the graphene islands, we had a particular kind of defect that had this beautiful electronic signature. Um, so the defect is just one, one carbon atom is missing, but that's not what we see in the STM. We see the electronic impact of a missing carbon atom. And another example of that is from my group at UNH, when we've been measuring black phosphorus, which incidentally is the same material I showed you the, the video of, it has these zigzag rows of atoms. So here's an atom of phosphorus, here's an atom of phosphorus, here's an atom of phosphorus. Um, this is what Black phosphorus looks like in a 3D model. So this is looking kind of into the material. It has this corrugated cardboard structure. So if we flip that on its, on its side so that we're looking at this top row here, then these are the zigzag rows of atoms that we're imaging. And now 
let's say we just remove one of those phosphorus atoms. What kind of impact does that have in the material? This big. We removed one atom. These are native defects. We didn't actually remove the atom. We remove one atom and we see an electronic signature that spans more than 20 atomic rows from this one defect. So this is my way of saying it's, it's really important to look at space sometimes. Like this one atom is having this broad ranging effect on this material. And, um, and this ring is one of my favorite things to see, um, which I won't go into today, but it's another electronic effect that you can see in STM. Okay, so finally, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what projects we're working on now. And one of them is a collaborative project um, with Patrick Vora, and um, who you know, and um, Kevin Yeager, who's actually giving the next talk in this session um, at Brookhaven National Lab. Um, and the questions we're asking are, like, we have these this whole group of materials called 2D materials that are made up of single atoms or single layers of atoms. And this gives you a lot of freedom to make sort of custom or artificial crystals, right? So here's an example of that. This is the top view of this material where the blue atoms are tantalum and the red atoms are sulfur. Um, but the the side view shows that you can that this material is a van der Waals material, meaning that the layers kind of stack on top of each other and you can peel them apart. Um, and here's a stacking, a potential stacking arrangement. So what we're doing in, in this research um, partnership is we're looking at these materials and we're going, and, and you'll hear more about this in the next talk, so I don't want to go too far into it, but um, we're taking these two layers of materials and we're intentionally um, twisting them relative to each other. If you've ever seen two window screens overlapping, then you've seen that a superstructure will form whenever you have two small patterns that overlap not perfectly. Um, and that superstructure is called a moray pattern. And in this project, we are interested in how the moray pattern affects the electronic properties due to the lattices overlapping, but also related to another superstructure that's naturally occurring in this material, which is that the electrons, um, the atoms like to bunch up so that an electron is kind of localized in one spot, okay? Um, and that's what, the, here's what it looks like in an STM image. So all these bright triangle shapes are um, electrons kind of trapped in this, in this um, star of 13 atoms. Um, so the, the pattern that you see here are localized electrons, and the atoms are kind of hidden by that um, localized electron pattern. So that's called a charge density wave, meaning that the charge density is changing in a wave-like way. Um, and we're interested in whether we can control that charge density wave, um, and whether controlling that charge density wave can then tune the local electronic properties of this material. Um, and then I wanted to show you some data of, of our first steps in that direction. Um, this is an image of some flakes that we exfoliated at, um, at the QPress facility at BNL, which you'll hear about in the next talk. Um, and you can see this pattern that I showed you on the other page of these localized electrons and these bright spots. But you can also see these big patches of things, right? And this pattern is changing in space. And what's causing these big patches of things? And by the way, their electronic properties are pretty different. Look, this patch is pink at this voltage that we chose, and this, this part is blue. So that means that at this, at this energy cut that I'm showing you here, the electronic properties of these patches are different. Um, and we think we can control these patches. So that is the project that we're working on now. So finally, I just want to say thanks to, uh, um, especially to my group, who are the ones who take all this wonderful data. Um, so here's an image of, of several people who are in my group now or have been in my group recently. Um, some of the data that you saw was taken by Jake Griffel. Um, some of it was taken by Ben Campbell. Some of it was taken by Olaya. Some of it was taken by Steven. 
Um, and then also some of it was taken by, by Ben. Um, and then my collaborators from um, George Mason and, and BNL, um, for sure. And then I also have collaborators at Brown University, at UNH Chemistry, um, Washington University, St. Louis, and the University of Maine. So thanks to everyone who's um, uh, contributed to the work that we do. And thanks to all of you for, for your attention. Um, and I will take questions. Hopefully I didn't go too far. I have a essential question for Dr. Holland. So the two, um, the tunneling current tells you topography and density of states, right? So how okay. do you just how do you distinguish between the topography of a sample and the local density of states at a particular position? So sometimes you need assistance from theory to disentangle those things. Um, but, but I think the first to, to first order, the difference you can see um, the, the types of data that we take that are, that are the DIDV maps um, are cuts in energy. So that helps um, pull apart the spec the um, electronic states like information from the topographical information um, and the and we can also take point spectroscopy which can help help us figure it out but for quantitative comparisons we do we do need um, some theory help so so um, density functional theory is a common um, common thing to use to do that. Any other questions? Then let's thank our speaker again so much for a wonderful